Uh, so yeah, uh, again, uh, my name is Lucas Shaw. I am the project manager for Clean Fleet. I have given presentations about the clearing house for the past three years, and as Kibby mentioned, I probably we have like 1,500 clients signed up, and I've been probably involved in at least like 800 of those, not counting drivers. So I've dealt with this a lot. Um, Obviously, if you guys had tried signing up any time between December 22nd and January 10th, you noticed that you could not do that. Um, since then, the FMCSA has had done some changes to allow uh, people to get around that, um, and we'll go over some of those details here. Um, so... You guys should be familiar with this. That is the original Italian poster for the good, the bad, and the ugly. And that is basically what the clearinghouse is. There's some good, there's some bad, there's some very ugly. So, the good. Um, queries work. Um, the SIDLIS system uh, at this point um, is, I'd say, about 99%. Um, you can enter driver's licenses, uh, name, state of birth, and you will be able to get then a response from the clearinghouse about whether there has been any violations reported. Since we are 25 days in since compliance and assuming that all the backlogs have been made up, um, you we should start to see more starting in February drivers who are actually prohibited from driving. So far, uh, at last check, we did about 200 queries and about 80 have come back already, not prohibited. Um, so as the system gets more results, you will start to see those, uh, you will start to see those queries pop back something with something other than not prohibited. Um, Reporting violations appears to be working. Um, we have not heard any complaints from any MROs. Uh, we personally have reported two violations. The form's very simple to fill out, um, and it's in there. Uh, uh, it, again, it uses the SIDLIS system, so uh, they're going in and approving the information uh, for the driver. Um, additionally, registration is generally stable. Um, as you, if you guys have interacted with the system at all, tried registering yourself or watched any of the videos that we put out, um, the initially the FMCSA wanted people to create a clearinghouse account and link it to the FMCSA portal which many, 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 many carriers did not know the system even existed. Um, it has been a requirement since 2017 that these portals are created. It actually, when that, going through that process of creating an authority, it creates a portal. Um, so the user ID and password has been available to carriers, for all carriers since 2017. Um, and older carriers maybe have not been familiar with it. Um, but the system, the systems needed to be linked just to confirm that it was that it was the actual company going in and registering on the clearinghouse. Um, it also created, it also put a DOT number in there and some other factors just to make sure um, that you could do that uh, or that you were authorized to do that. Um, the portal was not working. Um, you could create accounts, you could modify accounts for several weeks. So they encouraged people that needed to register with the clearinghouse to bypass it. So um, of the 1,500 or so clients that we have, about 700 of those have been set up bypassing the portal. Um, there is no word yet on when the FMCSA will require that step, but I do believe that it will be coming I probably wouldn't say until like June when at that point uh, auditors start to be more comfortable with what they need to be looking for in general. Um, there are still some issues with doing it that way, but the registration on the employer side is mostly, mostly successful. Um, additionally, with the drivers, again, it's using SIDLIS, which is stable now. 
Um, so there aren't that many problems registering as drivers. Um, and then for employers specifically, uh, pay.gov works. It's a, I, I think you're, you'll start to see pay.gov and logging.gov start to be more incorporated into general interactions with the federal government. And it's good that, you know, the electronic payment system works. Um, as you can see from the chart, um, when they said that we could bypass the portal, there was a pretty big spike in the number of companies we signed up. The purple line is the number we signed up. Um, so people really started paying attention eh, November-ish. Uh, and then when we had the portal issues, it flattened out. And then since, again, creating that bypass, we've seen a spike. So um, at this point, the FMCSA, <laughs> there's, if you're a carrier, you need to register with the clearinghouse. Uh, the requirement that you won't be out of compliance technically if you're not hiring any drivers until January 6, 2021. But if you plan on doing on any hiring at any point during the year, you need to be registered with the clearinghouse. There's no exception. Uh, the reason you'll be out of compliance January 6, 2021 is you have to do a query once a year. So if you're not registered January 6, 2021, and it's been an entire year and you haven't done a query. With that, uh, the site's unstable. Um, it is much more stable than it has been before. Um, but if there are a bunch of people on there at once, it has gone down. Uh, it generally, I haven't had any gateway issues. I, it was down temporarily for about 20 minutes yesterday. Um, so it's still kind of unstable. Um, SIDList is having issues, but this is primarily an issue to do with driver's licenses. Um, first and foremost, uh, Real ID in Oregon is going into effect next year, I'm pretty sure. Um, so people have been getting, upgrading their licenses, getting the new upgraded license in different states. Um, Washington did it first. And previously, I'm sure some of you have seen the Washington licenses, they had the last name and you know combination of numbers and letters. Um, they've since changed to a format that's WDL, that combination of numbers and letters followed by the letter B. Um, so some people who have changed the new WDL license, but have not surrendered their previous CDL to the DMV, SIDList does not recognize the new one. So if you have any drivers in Washington specifically that have upgraded they need to surrender their old CDL to the DMV so it can be removed. But that is also the case for anyone that has changed states. Um, if someone had, if you have a driver that had a CDL, let's say in Oregon, and then has since moved to Idaho and has an Idaho CDL, the Oregon CDL has to be surrendered to the Oregon DMV so they can remove it. I had that exact situation with someone that had an Oregon CDL, moved to Idaho, got an Idaho CDL. SIDLIST did not recognize his Idaho CDL, but it did recognize his old Oregon one. Now, all of these things are gonna be connected. So if you have a driver that has had that issue and then registers, can't use a new license, but he can use the old one, he still needs to do that. Um, but then when he surrenders his old CDL and the new one becomes active, then that information will be linked. Okay. Um, he'll need to go in and update it later, but eventually that's going to be the point. So it's happening if the, I think the primary thing is if somebody goes in, like, let's say someone that needs to get, have access to, you know, has a Twit card. So they have to go onto a port. They need a real ID. So then they'll go to Washington, they'll go to Washington DMV and get a new license issued. Then they're not surrendering their ID as opposed to their old license expiring and then getting a new one. That's the primary difference. Yes, it should be fine. But if they just get a new one, they need to surrender. Yeah. Um, 
again, with Washington, if they still have the old licenses, they sometimes have the stars in there as special characters. Sometimes it works. Sometimes it doesn't work. Sometimes you put it in with the special characters. It won't work. Then you'll take them out, and then it will work. And then next time you'll do it without the special characters, and it won't work. Then you put the special characters in, and it does work. There's absolutely no consistency there. Uh, additionally, Indiana and Florida have dashes in those. Those do, should not have dashes in there. If you have someone that has a driver's license that's, I believe it's Indiana, Florida, Georgia, that have dashes in there, don't include the dashes when they're registering. Just mm -hmm. put in the number. It should be fine. And then uh, additionally, uh, carriers are still completely unaware. Um, We've been sending out email blasts, what, we sent like eight in 2019 and continue and we're making calls every single day with carriers and we still run into people that pick up the phone and have no idea what we're talking about. Um, the FMCSA has done an extremely poor job of trying to educate people and get people involved. They, they in an email uh, after January 6th, they patted themselves on the back. It's like, we got several thousand registered. It's everyone. Um, so, uh, there's still people out there, um, if you do run into people, guys out there on the road operating 26,000 pounds and they haven't heard about this, they need to be registered. There are no exceptions anymore. Um, the employer, this is more CTPA side, the employer list isn't very user friendly. Um, so if you call in to your CTPA and you're like, hey, I just want to make sure you're reg we're registered. Give them some time. The list is not very good. And if you self-registered and maybe have made a mistake, it's gonna be harder for them to locate you. They just put the list in alphabetical order and there's it's literally just on there in alphabetical order. There's no way to organize the data. Um, and then uh, conducting queries isn't particularly user-friendly. Um, as a carrier doing your own queries, you can just, it just pulls up that information right away. Again, on the CTPA side, we have to type in your name or your DOT number completely for it to pop up. Um, so improvements are needed still, but this isn't as bad. Um, it's the ugly stuff that I'm particularly concerned about. Um, starting with the portal. The portal is extremely unstable. Um, any of you who have not had a portal account and tried creating a portal account in the past 30 days have likely failed in doing so. There are a variety of different errors. The chooser error is a very common one. It'll say, yeah, you've completed everything. You put in your credentials, enter it, screen goes blank, URL fills chooser. That's super common. Uh, you might also run into an issue where your credentials work but then it has not sent you up as the company official, even though you just did it, then you won't be able to add the permission to link it to the clearinghouse at all. Um, so the portal's unstable. I've had, to, I had some recent success yesterday. I made four portal accounts. That's success for me. It's creating four of those. Um, additionally with that, um, supports non-existent. Uh, the portal team um, in October and November, they probably responded in about a week. First week of December, it was like two weeks. I heard from an FMCSA representative that in the month of December, the portal team received 11,000 requests for assistance. So they are incredibly backlogged. If you have an issue right now where maybe the portal was set up by a previous employee or maybe you forgot the user ID or you forgot your password and you need help resetting it, all that stuff, do not expect a response anytime soon. I would say that months before they get, get to your query. Um, initially, in a bunch of requests that we sent late December, they emailed us this boilerplate BS response about not, not needing it anymore. So the support is not there. Um, if you are in a situation, if you're in the situation where you need assistance, 
before you can do register with the clearinghouse, just register with the clearinghouse, bypass the portal, link it later. Um, if you currently do not have a portal account, try making a portal account. You'll need your user, I, uh, I'm sorry, you will need your uh, DOT number and your DOT PIN. Um, try creating a portal account. If it works, great, link it up, follow the basic way to register. If not, don't worry about it. Just create the Clearinghouse account, work on the portal later. Um, uh, additionally, uh, using the function to forgot your user ID nev almost never works. You'll, you have to create secret questions. If you answer the three secret questions correctly, it'll just say, contact FMCSA. Yeah, yeah. Um, so don't worry about it. Just register with the clearinghouse, send in a request to the FMCSA, and then don't expect a response for a while. And then, um, yeah, choose your error I talked about. Um, additionally, clearinghouse support is nil. Uh, I have sent five emails to the clearinghouse and gotten responses to two of them three weeks later. So the, if the portal team was under, is understaffed, the clearinghouse team is terribly understaffed. I think they literally only have two employees. So if you have issues with the clearinghouse that need to be remedied by the, by the clearinghouse team, I recommend you just start over. Burn the login.gov account, start over again, because there is no help coming. Um, so this, uh, this other point is about interstate carriers. Um, for, your, for you guys that, that are interstate carriers, you're familiar with the biennial update, right? You submit an MCS 150 form every two years, Update your contact information, update your address, all that jazz. Intrastate character carriers, specifically in Oregon, have not needed to do that. So the FMCSA has records that are from when they initially set up their authority, sometimes from the 80s and 90s. So when you're trying to get your DOT PIN requested, they oftentimes have old information. They either have the address from when they first set up the company, which isn't there. They definitely don't have a cell phone because cell phones weren't a thing in the 90s. And they don't have an email address because was the, that wasn't a thing in the late 90s either. So then they have to send you your PIN via snail mail, which could take seven to 10 days. If you are an intrastate carrier who has not submitted an MCS 150 ever, please do it <laughs> it's super easy the form is on the fmcsa website it takes four minutes to do submit it to the fmcsa and they will your information will be updated in 48 hours that will make it so much easier to actually get your dot pin if you don't have it because i've also run into this carriers that are from the 80s didn't have dot pin <laughs> And the only way you can get a DOT pin is by submitting an MCS 150. So again, if you know intrastate carriers who have never done this before, they should probably do it. Again, I want to make sure and stress that the DOT pin and the DOT number are different and that your ODOT number has nothing to do with the DOT pin. Your DOT number comes from the FMCSA. Your DOT PIN comes from the FMCSA. Additionally, if you are an interstate carrier, you have two PINs. You have a DOT PIN and an MC PIN. They are, they're the same format. Number, letter, number, number, letter, letter. You need to know which one is which. I've had people give me one of the PINs. I'm like, oh, it doesn't work. Well, that's the only PIN I have. Well, that's the MC PIN. So now we need to request your DOT PIN. So, uh, to reiterate, if you are an intrastate carrier, please do the biennial update. I don't know who I need to, I'll talk, I've, I've talked about this with Dave and when I was at MTAC uh, a couple weeks ago, I don't know what Oregon needs to do, but they need to start requiring that this MCS 150 form be submitted just so that information can be updated because they're not sharing that with the Federal Motor Carrier. 
um, it, it's a requirement. If you have a DOT number, if you have a US DOT number, you're supposed to be doing this every two years. And if you go on Safer, you'll see on there, hey, this company is in is uh, out of uh, out of compliance. So if you if you're trying to get a job and you're noticing, hey, people are rejecting me, it's probably because of that. Because on Safer it says this carrier is out of date. More ugly. Uh, currently, the portal link is deactivated. So even if you set up on the clearinghouse. You bypass the portal. You somehow got the portal to work. Now you want to link them? Can't do it. It's grayed out completely. Um, I don't know when that is going to be remedied, but this is particularly difficult for those carriers who are owner operators and accidentally registered as a driver rather than an employer. There is no way to link it back. To the portal. So in those instances, again, we have to burn the login doc up and start all over again. Um, I don't. Again, I, there's no word on when this will be remedied. Yesterday, it looked like the link was active for about 30 seconds, and then it went away again. Um, but if you have registered with the clearinghouse and you have not linked your portal, and you have your portal credentials now, and you have the permission added. You can't link it. Save that information when the FMCSA requires it, when they send an out notification for that, um, then you'll be able to link it at that point. Um, the SID list, the SID list update, kind of what I went over before. Again, if you had if you have a driver that had an active CDL in another state went to a different state and got a CDL, they need to surrender the old CDL. It will not recognize the new CDL in there. Um, the uh, query, the, the for those larger carriers, the batch form for batch query upload, the formatting's terrible, it doesn't work. I tried using it yesterday. I don't know when they're gonna fix that either. And then, um, if you do do the board portal bypass, you've got to make sure that you enter the information on there exactly how it appears on your MCS 150. I have had several companies register doing the bypass and they will use their DBA name rather than their legal name, which leads to situations with companies that have the same name. I have two LD transports right now. I don't know which one is which because they just put LD transport instead of their legal name and there's no DOT number. Additionally, there have been uh, someone put in their email address as their legal name and then someone else put their address as their legal name. The email address I was able to figure out, but I can't figure out the address. There's no way I can search it. When I put the address in Google, nothing shows up. So if you are self-registering yourself without a portal account, doing a bypass, make sure that the information entered under company information is exactly how it appears on your MCS 150 or on the Safer website. Okay, to get to your question about drivers, current drivers do not need to be registered on the clearinghouse. The only drivers that need to be registered on the clearinghouse are drivers that are seeking new employment or have a violation. The reason being, if they are seeking new employment before they can perform safety sensitive functions, they need to give permission for that full query. That requires electronic consent on the clearinghouse. So those drivers need to register. If a driver has a violation, part of the new requirement now is that when when that violation is reported, it will say on the clearinghouse, this driver is prohibited from performing safety sensitive functions. That status can only be changed by a substance abuse professional who has access to that driver's clearinghouse account. So the driver will need to register on the clearinghouse and assign a substance abuse professional who will update the clearinghouse to say, this driver has one, seen me, and two, completed their um, 
completed their treatment and is now eligible for a return to duty test. Those, again, those are the only two instances in which drivers need to register with the clearinghouse. I said this last year, I've said it a couple times, I'll say it again. There is 100% a chance someone, some driver right now working for a company will never register with the clearinghouse because they will never get a new job and they will never have a violation. So they will have no reason to register with the clearinghouse. As an employer, you can encourage your drivers to register, but it is not a requirement. If you had a driver recently leave the company in the last week mm -hmm. or next week, mm -hmm. and they obviously haven't registered through the U.S. for the clearinghouse, uh, mm -hmm. what is their situation? Will they have to be dealt with when they try to hire on with the new company? So, again, I just want to stress that drivers that register do not register the register on the clearinghouse with the company. They register as drivers. So if a driver leaves your employee, you don't have to worry about anything on the clearinghouse. There's literally nothing. When he tries to get a new job, he will need to register with the clearinghouse and give electronic consent to that new employer that wants him to do a pre-employment drug test. That's it. Yes, sir. We had the unfortunate opportunity to report a violation for one of our drivers. Right. He was issued a uh, DUI at a scale. Um, that citation apparently isn't reported by CHP. It's actually reported by the motor carrier. Correct. Um, part of that process is it asks for the driver to acknowledge the public information they're reporting to that. You guys have some sort of a blank form or is there a bullet point? Boilerplate form that we could use? To, so, to so, no, there is not. And to be perfectly frank, the FMCSA has fought constantly to provide boilerplate forms. Another thing that I just want to make sure all of you, all of you that are employers that hire, uh, that have drivers that are not yourself, um, they need to sign a consent form for the annual query additionally. So just something out there. Um, so in that instance, um, obviously report you reported it. Um, and what what's unique about that situation as well with the DUI is that it is you reported it to the clearinghouse, you got a DUI, but the driver can have it removed if the DUI doesn't lead to a conviction. So, yes, you did. Um, so you reported it. Um, the, I, I would just have a, st just have a standard form to say, Hey, this is, we're reporting this. I mean, the driver can try to dispute it, but if you have the records there, the clearinghouse isn't going to remove it. Um, so yeah, I mean, there, there is, again, there is no standard form. The FMCSA doesn't like standard forms um, for dealing with driver stuff like that. So, um, yeah, just good on you for doing it. It's uh, not fun, but uh, very briefly, uh, we'll push through some other changes in the drug and alcohol testing process. Um, so, big thing is that... Uh, we're going to 50% this year. Uh, I'm sure some of you have already received notices. If you are a clean fleet client, you most certainly have. Um, the reason they went uh, to 50% is because they're required, they're legally required to do so if the testing rate is above 1%. Um, hmm? Well, yeah, yeah, the positivity rate is above 1%. Um, we had been expecting this for two years. Um, if you look at some of the uh, information from private drug testing companies like Quest, they've been indicating that the positive testing rate for employees has been hovering, has been increasing to its highest level since 2005. So this is not unexpected. It moves it in line with most of the other DOT modes. Currently, now there are only two DOT modes at 25%. FAA and um, service employees for FRA. Everyone else is at 50. Um, and uh, 
they, that rate cannot go down until there are three consecutive years below 1%. So for the foreseeable future, at least the next three years, expect 50% testing rate. Um, for you guys, this is basically going to mean that you're going to have you're going to have more tests. Just, it's just the way it is. Uh, you'll have more people that will need to go in and do randoms, um, and it probably is going to uh, lead to more positives. Um, but in the long run, this is going to increase the uh, decrease the amount of violators on the road. Um, and it's going to make roads safer. Um, yes. And then again, uh, the clearinghouse specifically is designed to stop people from like job hopping. Um, so again, when we're doing these queries, uh, if the driver is not prohibited, when you do the full query, it'll say not prohibited. Um, and then if they do have a violation, it will say prohibited. And then you know not to move for, forward with them. Um, and so in your hiring process, again, there's basically two things you need to expect. One, driver has to be registered with the clearinghouse to get permission for the full query. And then additionally, in your new hire paperwork, you wanna include the document that gives permission for the annual queries. Um, again, you can change the language however you like, uh, but just something basic is all the FMCSA expects. You are expected to keep that documentation on file now for three years after they leave your employee. Um, oral fluid testing um, is coming. Uh, if you guys have not uh, heard about oral fluid testing, it is um, much less invasive than urine testing. The detection window is a little bit smaller, so we can really determine, okay, did this person uh, use drugs recently or was this like a weekend thing? Um, so this is, uh, it's gonna be, uh, it's gonna be coming here pretty soon. Um, we're expecting it to be primarily adapted in the FMCSA as an alternate method in situations where um, uh, where there's a shy bladder, and then additionally, um, post-accident, to really, again, nail in on whether this person has been using right this minute, very recently. Um, it, uh, the guidance from HHS actually came in October, it went into effect in January. They have given the Department of Transportation about a year to start coming up with the rules for this. Um, FMCSA will probably be the first one to come up with rules because they have the most people, but all DOT modes will be affected. And I expect that there will be some exceptions to start. Um, yeah, so we're expecting it again. I expect it in January in 2021, probably. Post-accident testing is where I think it will be most relevant um, as an, and also as an alternate to urine testing. Um, but 2021, maybe November, dis November, October, expect to start seeing rules because the FMCSA is legally and the DOT are legally required to implement these changes because the HHS has made this recommendation. Um, hair testing, if you guys are also unfamiliar, the detection window is much longer. You're looking at between 30 and 90 days. Um, and there has been some success with it. However, um, it was included in a law that was passed in 2015, but it has been sitting on OMB's desk for about six months. And the reason for that is that the scientific consensus, as well as the industry support behind hair testing is not there like it is in oral fluid testing. Oral fluid testing has had over 20 years of testing and, and uh, finding out what works and what doesn't work. Hair testing is relatively newer and um, 
many industry groups, specifically OIDA, has come out against hair testing being implemented primarily because there was a, a volunteer program for truck drivers to submit to hair testing that has shown zero um, effect in making roads safer or, or detecting drugs more effectively. So although Congress has put in this rule and HHS has submitted this to um, OMB, don't expect it anytime soon. Um, FMCSA, probably, I, I would say FMCSA isn't going to worry about this until like 2022, 20, maybe later. Um, primarily here, we're maybe going to see this. This would probably be useful in pre-employment testing just because the window is so much longer. Um, so you could really take care of people that have uh, eliminate those drivers uh, out there that have had a violation, then try to wait like 30 days, get around the clearinghouse somehow, it's not possible, but uh, then try to test again, this will cover that window.